25, 37-year-old Jeannie Hesselschwert was living with her fiance, Mike Monahan in Arlington, Massachusetts. The couple had been together for 10 years and their family said they really loved each other and they were a great couple. In July of that year, Jeannie and Mike left for a planned trip to Yosemite National Park in California to go backpacking and sightseeing. On July 9th, the couple arrived at Yosemite and they entered via this road that was only open during the summer. So as such, it was totally desolate and they were the only ones on this road. And they had about a two, two and a half hour drive until they reached the spot they were going to actually stop at. So they had the scenic drive up the road and about two hours into this drive, there was this turnout on the side of the road where a couple of other tourists were standing and sightseeing and Jeannie and Mike decided they wanted to pull over and get out and stretch their legs. So they pulled over in the turnout and when they got out, Mike said he wanted to walk down the trail a little ways to this area that apparently was good for bird watching. And Jeannie didn't want to do that. She wanted to walk in the other direction up to this overlook. And so they decided that they would each get to do their own activities. They'd be gone for 15 minutes and then meet back at the car. So Mike heads down and does his bird watching. And then after 15 minutes, he walks back up to the car expecting to see Jeannie, but she's not there. And this is 1995. Neither of them had a cell phone. And so he can't just call her. And so he just stands by the car and waits. And so he's looking around, waiting for her to reemerge out of the trail she had left on. But after 15 more minutes goes by and he still hasn't seen her, he walks up to some of the tourists that were there in the first place and he asked them, hey, have you seen this woman, Jeannie? And he described what she looked like. And they said, no, we haven't seen her. And so he goes back to the car and now he's getting pretty anxious and he's looking around and he's just waiting for her to show up. And another 15 minutes goes by. So now she's 30 minutes late and he starts walking up the trail to see if he can find her. But he realizes the trail immediately spiders off in different directions. And so she could have gone in any one of these different pathways. And so at this point he decides, I have to get authorities involved, time is of the essence. And so he runs back to his car and he sees a park service employee emptying a trash can into a dumpster. And so he runs over to them and he says, you know, my fiance, Jeannie, she's gone. She's been gone for 30 minutes. Can you please get in touch with authorities and get people up here looking for her? Within 45 minutes of speaking to this employee, park rangers had made their way up to this area and they began talking to Mike and figuring out where she might have gone. And they start walking down the trail to look for her. But after an hour of not finding her, the park rangers would call in additional assistance from the police. The search for Jeannie would become the largest in Yosemite's history, expanding to 40 square miles with helicopters overhead and dog handlers on the ground and hundreds of volunteers combing this whole area. But despite the relatively quick response time and massive amount of manpower, they could not find Jeannie. After two weeks of looking everywhere for her, the only thing they were able to find were two boot prints that they believed belonged to Jeannie. The first print was found in the vicinity of where their car was parked, so where she had actually disappeared from. And then the other one was curiously located on a trail that was one of the biggest trails in Yosemite. It was very well marked, it was fairly wide. You're not gonna mistake this for anything other than a trail. And the boot print was not walking along the trail. It was cutting across it as if she was going from woodline, crossing over the trail into the other woodline. This second print didn't make any sense to authorities because they're thinking, you know, if you're lost out in the middle of the woods and you come across a clearly defined trail, a really obvious, obvious trail, you wouldn't walk across it and go back into the woods. You would take the trail in either direction until it hits civilization because all trails do that for the most part. And so it seemed like this print could not be hers because that would indicate she has chosen not to follow this path. But the print was hers. Over the course of these two weeks of searching, several dog teams had been placed right where Mike's car had been, right where Jeannie had left to go to the trail where she disappeared. And the dogs could not pick up a scent of Jeannie. And it led the handlers to believe that Mike was actually lying and that Jeannie had actually never been in Yosemite. And this was all a big ploy because he had done something to her and he was gonna act like she's lost in the wilderness and he was gonna get away with whatever he did to her. And so ultimately the FBI got involved because now foul play is being suggested. And the first thing the FBI did is they polygraphed Mike and he passed without question and he was totally vindicated of any involvement. After that, the FBI dug into Mike's background and Jeannie's background to see if there was any indication of somebody that might want to do Jeannie harm and they couldn't find anything. She was just gone and nobody knew what happened to her. On September 3rd, so two months after Jeannie went missing, two men were in this really remote section of Yosemite to go fishing when they spotted a human body in a pool of water. 
it would turn out to be Jeannie's. She was three miles from where she was last seen by Mike at that trailhead. She was only wearing socks and one boot, and she had been sitting in this pool of water for so long that they were unable to determine a cause of death. Initially, it was speculated that she must have fallen into the river that fed ultimately down to where she was found. She must have fallen into that river, you know, miles away, close to where she went missing. Maybe she fell and hit her head and was unconscious, and then she drowned, and then she wound up here. But park officials said there's too many debris along this waterway that her body would never have been able to get down to this spot. But if she didn't drift to that spot, it meant she had to have gotten there on foot. And to get to this particular spot, according to the fishermen that were interviewed after they found her, the only way to get there is to climb up a cliff with climbing gear on or scale down a cliff again with climbing gear on. The only people that go fishing in this area are mountain climbers and rock climbers that have the equipment to get there. From where Jeannie went missing, she would have had to climb down 2,000 feet of cliff face to get to this spot, and she did not have climbing gear. And so when that seemed really unlikely, the next theory was, okay, she must have been abducted and, and they brought her here. But that means your assailant would have had to carry Jeannie down this 2,000 foot cliff, which also seems really unrealistic. The most widely accepted theory was put forth by a tracker that was involved in this case. They went out and they surveyed the area where Jeannie would have been, and they noticed that the sound the wind made when it passed by this particular clump of aspen trees, when the wind hit the leaves in the trees, it sounded like a car driving by. And so they speculated that maybe, you know, Jeannie, she's scared, you know, she's panicking, it's nighttime, and she hears this sound and she thinks she's hearing a road. And so she would have walked towards the sound of, you know, the car, which really was the leaves, and she would have disregarded, for example, the trail. She would have walked over the trail because she's trying to get down to this road. She's kind of fixated on this road. And at some point she could have potentially wound up at the side of that cliff that would have led down to where she was found. And then she could have slipped and fallen over the edge and landed in one of the rivers that would have flowed down to where she was found. But park officials and authorities were a little bit skeptical of this theory because for her to have landed in a stretch of water that did connect to where she was found, it was almost like she would have had to leap off the cliff to land in that stretch of water. It wouldn't have been just falling over the edge and then you're landing in this water. It would have been more of a jump to get to it. So the idea that, you know, Jeannie is running and leaping off cliffs, that doesn't really add up either. But park officials and authorities, they don't have a better theory. In fact, no one has a better theory. We're just left with a lot of questions like, how did she wind up in this inaccessible area? Why didn't the dogs pick up her scent? Why didn't she take that trail down to safety? Why did she cross over it? Unfortunately, we'll probably never know the answer. On September 19th, 2013, 69-year-old retired middle school teacher Amy Linkert and her friend, 63-year-old Joe Blakesley, who was a physician, headed off to the Craters on the Moon Park in Idaho. This park is actually a dormant volcano. It's not extinct. It's going to be active again probably in the next 1,000 years. But for now, it's this beautiful park that is known for these crazy lava fields that look otherworldly. You know, barely any vegetation can grow on them, and there's just a strip of, of pavement they've kind of weaved through these massive jagged lava fields. And then you have all these big mounds that are the actual volcanoes. Another feature of this park are all the lava tubes underground. All the molten lava, when it jets around underneath the surface before shooting out, it carves these natural tunnels underground, these huge caverns. They're like these big caves you can explore. And there's 1,100 miles of lava tubes, tunnels, and caves underneath this park. The two women told their families they would be back in Boise, Idaho by the 21st. But when the 21st came and they were not home, their families were suspicious. They tried calling them, they didn't pick up. And for the next 36 hours, they just kept trying to call them and you know called around to see if anybody else knew where they were. And then finally, on the morning of the 23rd, when no one knew where they were, they reached out to the authorities. The formal search for these two women began on the 24th, so five days after they had initially left for this trip. And the searchers quickly found their pickup truck parked in the parking lot of the Craters on the Moon Park. And in their truck were their two dogs who were alive, they were okay, and in the front seat were their purses and their cell phones. But there was no sign of Amy or Joe. This was obviously a bad sign, and so the search was really kicked into high gear to see if they could find these women before it was too late. But unfortunately, within 24 hours of finding the truck, they would find Amy's body. And her body was located 
way off of the main trail. She was in an area that the park superintendent described as incredibly rugged and inaccessible. Now at this park, there is a strip of cement that weaves through this really dangerous lava field. And if you were on this strip of cement, you wouldn't be thinking about walking onto the lava field. Not only would you need to navigate all these massive mounds of jagged, cooled lava, there's all these cracks in the ground that you could fall through and just plummet to your death. So no one's about to start walking off the trail, especially not two older women that went here just to have a casual stroll through the park. They were not there for some grand adventure. They were not athletic distance hikers. It made no sense that Amy would be so far off the trail in an area that was so dangerous and so clearly off limits. When the families were notified that Amy had been found and they were still looking for Joe, the detail that the family keyed in on was the idea that these two women left their dogs in the truck. That was something so unbelievably uncharacteristic of either of them. They adored those two dogs. They would never, ever abandon them like that. In fact, because of that detail, the families jumped to this has to be foul play because they never would have done that. They wouldn't have abandoned these precious dogs. The search for Joe would continue. They basically shifted the entire effort to center over Amy where she was found and work in circles out from there to see if they could find her. They had helicopters flying overhead. They had mining experts walking through all the lava tubes below and they couldn't find her. Finally, on October 23rd, so 28 days after Amy was found, Joe's body was discovered as well, and she was lying one mile away from where Amy had been found in a similarly inaccessible part of the park that would have required significant climbing over jagged, cooled lava fields and all these cracks in the ground she would have had to navigate to reach where she was. And even more strangely is the area where she was found had been searched extensively by air with helicopter pilots flying overhead and by cadaver sniffing dogs that had been in that area and they had not picked up her scent. So either the helicopter pilots and the cadaver sniffing dogs were just wrong or missed something, or Joe had not been there the whole time. A cause of death has not been determined for either of the two women. However, what was released is neither of them appeared to have suffered an incapacitating injury, meaning they weren't struck down where they were. They were traveling and ultimately stopped where they were. It seems highly unlikely that these two women abandoned their two dogs and left their cell phones in the car and then wandered way off the trail and separated from each other all without supplies. But even if they had done that, even if they had, you know, separated and left the trail, where they ultimately reached seems like an area they would not have been able to get to without assistance. And since they were separated, they weren't able to help each other get where they were. So although authorities have ruled out foul play, this was deemed an accident, it does seem like if there was ever a place to commit an attack, it would be this particular park because underneath the park is 1,100 miles of lava tubes that connect to each other and weave all through the park. And there's hundreds of caves, many of which have not been found or explored, that it would be pretty straightforward to attack someone and then go underground and not be found. Certainly makes you wonder who or what could be hiding underground in those lava tubes. On March 7th, 1975, 21-year-old Mark Hansen, along with two of his friends from college, Ben Fish and John Chidester, arrived at a parking lot on the eastern side of the Appalachian Trail. All three of the young men were in incredible physical shape and were excited to spend their spring break challenging themselves on some of the trail's most rigorous hikes. The day before they were supposed to go, they almost canceled the trip because there was this terrible weather system that was coming over the trail. And they were thinking, you know, it's going to be dangerous. It's not such a good idea. And then they started talking some more and they were like, well, we're already going to, you know, challenge ourselves. It would be even more challenging to hike these really difficult trails with the inclusion of bad weather. So this is another way to, you know, test our abilities. And so they kind of got pumped up at the idea of hiking the Appalachian Trail in terrible weather. So the guys arrive in the parking lot, you know, the windshield wipers are furiously working to keep the pouring rain off. They hop out and they're getting soaked by the rain. They put on their ponchos, they grab their heavy packs and they make their way over to the trail. Their plan was to move west along the trail until they hit the Tri-Corner Shelter where they would spend their first night. The Tri-Corner Shelter is one of the many shelters along the Appalachian Trail. They are open to the public. There's no heating or electricity. 
but it provides shelter from the storm. You can go in there and, you know, get in the sleeping bag and you'll be fine. But to get to the Tri-Corner Shelter, they would need to hike 16 miles, almost completely uphill, walking right into the wind and it's raining on them and it's supposed to snow later on. So it's just a treacherous, treacherous first day. But they take off, they start walking up this trail. And after a couple of miles, John says, you know what, guys, this is awful. I think we should probably turn around. I think we've, we've underestimated how bad this is going to be. Let's go back to the car and we'll do this another time. But Mark and Ben were like, oh no, we are committed. We are doing this. We are not turning around. And John's like, you know what? Suit yourself. I'm not going to do that. And he turned around and he left and he went back to the car and he would pick them up when they were done. After John turned around, Mark and Ben, you know, they felt good. They felt tough. They're going to stick this hike out. And so they take off again and Ben's in the lead and Ben seems to be handling the poor weather and difficult hike and heavy pack a lot better than Mark is. In fact, over the next several hours, Mark would drift farther and farther back and Ben would need to wait for him and Mark would be hunched over, you know, really just struggling with this hike. And then at some point, Mark yells to him and says, I gotta take my pack off. I can't carry this much weight up this hill until we get to the shelter. I'm not gonna make it to the shelter. And Ben would say to him, you know, if we don't get to the shelter for some reason, you're gonna be stranded out here in this storm without any warm clothes, without your sleeping bag, without your tent, without your food, without your water. It's, it's way too dangerous. You have to keep your pack on. And so finally, Mark is convinced and he's like, oh, all right, puts his pack back on and they continue moving. About an hour later at 7 p.m., they had reached the section of the trail where they knew they were getting close-er, close-ish to the tri-corner shelter. They were certainly well beyond the halfway point but it was dark out, the temperature had dropped significantly. At this point, Ben is basically Mark's cheerleader, kind of egging him on to keep moving, and Mark's kind of staggering along this trail, and Ben and Mark are just hoping that shelter just appears at some point here because they don't know how much farther they can go. Another hour and a half goes by, they still haven't made it to the shelter. Mark is groaning, he can barely move, it's pitch black, the rain has now completely shifted over to snow and it is just dumping snow on them. And Ben is concerned that, you know, somehow did we take a wrong turn, even though they were on a really well-marked trail and he, and he knew they hadn't. He figured they must be so close at this point. And it was around this time that Mark yells out to Ben, I'm done, I can't go any farther. And he sits down right in the middle of the trail. He's sitting down with his pack and he's just laying there. And Ben is like, come on, we're so close. You can't sit down now. And Mark's like, I'm not moving. I can't do any more. I'm gonna sleep right here. Ben knows this is a bad idea. I mean, they did have warm clothes and sleeping bags and they probably would be just fine sleeping out in the middle of the trail but it just seemed so unnecessarily risky when there's probably a shelter maybe a couple hundred meters away and he would turn out to be right. And so he decides he's gonna walk ahead on the trail and he's gonna see if the shelter's there, but he only went about a hundred meters. He was within maybe a hundred meters of the actual shelter, but he never saw it. And so after going ahead and, and feeling like, man, I don't wanna drag Mark any farther, you know, if there's no shelter ahead, for all we know, we took a wrong turn. And so he turns back around and he goes back near Mark, not next to him, but close enough to him that he can see him. And he sits down on the trail too. He gets his sleeping bag out, he crawls inside and he falls asleep. That night, Ben would have this vivid, horrible nightmare where he heard Mark screaming for help, yelling for Ben to come save him as he's being dragged off the trail into the forest. And it scared him so much that Ben woke up and he looks down the trail to where Mark is and he can see Mark's backpack is sitting right on the trail. And so he thinks, oh, Mark's still there. And he's so tired, he's not about to get up and go check. He's like, that was just a dream. And he goes back to sleep. The next morning when the sun comes up, Ben gets up again. And the first thing he does is he looks over at Mark and he sees the pack but he realizes that Mark is not there. It's just the backpack. And so Ben jumps up and he yells for Mark. He doesn't get a response. He's looking around thinking he's gotta be around here, but he's not. It snowed that night, so any tracks Mark would have left to show where he went to were now covered up. And that's when it dawns on Ben that that dream he had the night before, that might've been real. And he has this sinking feeling that something horrible has happened to Mark and that he didn't save him. And so he thinks, I gotta get authorities. He grabs his bag, he leaves Mark's there because he's thinking maybe he'll come back and he'll grab it. And Ben turns and runs down the trail in the direction he hopes is towards this tri-corner shelter. And he can't believe it when literally 200 meters away, he finds the tri-corner shelter, they were that close. 
and inside are other hikers. He was able to get one of them to run down and get park services to know that they have a missing hiker on the trail. Searchers were dispatched to the area where Mark and Ben had been sleeping on the trail. The first thing they did is they went to his bag and inside were all the things he would need to survive out in the wild. His tent, his warm clothes, his sleeping bag, his food, his water, everything. It was all left there. Over the next few days, hundreds of searchers combed the area, they had helicopters overhead, and they made no significant discovery. However, one park ranger discovered this huge cave that was not that far away from where they had been sleeping. And inside of this cave, this ranger said a large mammal had been staying recently, it was not there now, and there was all these animal bones inside the cave. So it was obviously a predator of some kind. And so there was speculation that between this cave that probably held, you know, a bear or something like that, and Ben's dream that probably was reality of Mark being pulled off the trail screaming for help, that maybe Mark was attacked by some animal that dragged him away. On the ninth day of the search, Mark's body was found. It was located three miles down the hill from where he and Ben had been sleeping up on that trail. Mark was positioned up against a tree. His jacket was open, his gloves were off and his boots were off and they were placed right next to him. An autopsy concluded he must have died within 24 to 36 hours of leaving that trail. So there's lots of questions with this one, namely, why did Mark in the middle of the night get up, not tell Ben where he was going, and then leave the trail and walk three miles away. The trail they were on was very well worn, that even at night in a snowstorm, it would be very obvious if you were on the trail or if you were off the trail. If you look at this picture, this is a section of the trail they were on. This is not the literal place they were at, but this is a good representation. As you can clearly see, there is a trail that runs down the middle, and then there is the forest to the side of that trail. That if you were to leave the trail, you'd be bumping into trees left and right. It would be very obvious you were off the trail. So Mark had to have known he was leaving the trail. But even if Mark had a great reason for wanting to leave the trail, just hours earlier, he couldn't even stand. That's why they were even laying on the trail to begin with, because he couldn't go any farther. So the idea that he can just jump up in the middle of the night and navigate this really difficult terrain for three miles in total darkness in the snow, that doesn't make sense either. And then you have Ben's dream where he hears Mark screaming for help and he's yelling for Ben to come save him as he's getting dragged off the trail. There's a good chance what Ben was hearing and seeing in his dream was actually playing out just several feet away from him down the trail. So David Politis and the other people involved in the search they all believe the key to understanding what happened to Mark is what caused him to scream for help and potentially what pulled him off the trail and dragged him three miles away. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please befriend the like button and when they give you their phone for you to enter your number in, go ahead and Venmo yourself a thousand dollars and then give them their phone back. seemed to have an issue with respecting boundaries. In 1996, when Daniel was 24 years old, he became obsessed with this video game series called Ultima, which in the early days of PC gaming was this huge hit. It was this open world role-playing fantasy game. Daniel figured out where the creator of this game lived, and in the middle of the night, in the spring of that year, he went to this guy's house and he knocked on the door. And when the creator did not answer the door, Daniel's frustrated and he leaves, but comes back back a couple hours later and proceeds to break a window, climb inside this guy's house, he goes upstairs and he goes into one of the bedrooms where he crawls into one of the beds and falls asleep. The next morning when the creator got up, he finds Daniel laying in one of his beds and he starts yelling at him to get out of his house and Daniel's totally unfazed and he just wants to sleep in this bed. And so the guy calls the police, the police show up and Daniel's still in bed. And so they haul him out and they arrest him. A year later, Daniel would be arrested again for trespassing this time in Orlando, Florida at SeaWorld, where Daniel had, after hours, snuck into the manatee exhibit and was swimming around with the manatees because apparently he wanted to play with them. But despite his criminal history, Daniel was far from a hardened criminal. In fact, many people that knew him described him as a very gentle, pot-smoking hippie 
who just adored animals. In 1999, when Daniel was 27, he joined a small religious community of people that practiced Hare Krishna, which is a branch of Hinduism. They get their name from their chant, Hare Krishna, that devotees repeat over and over and over again. During his stay with this community, Daniel basically blew off all of his responsibilities. He didn't really practice the religion. He didn't help out around the temple. Instead, he spent virtually all of his time feeding the wild birds that came to roost inside of the temple's garden. And he kept this notebook where he diligently tracked who had come into the garden, which bird, and how much he had fed them, and what they looked like. Basically, all he cared about were these birds. After a month of living in the Hare Krishna community, Daniel abruptly tells the other worshippers that he's going to be taking a vow of silence. And this really confused the others because Hare Krishna does not encourage its members to take vows of silence. This was something Daniel was just going to do on his own. And so right before he took his vow of silence, he also informed them that he would be leaving. So he takes his vow of silence, he packs his stuff up, and he leaves. After departing, Daniel committed a series of petty offenses through South Carolina, Washington, Texas, and then ultimately in Florida. One of his offenses in Florida was stealing a candy bar at a 7-Eleven. And in court, because of his vow of silence that he was still living up to, he had to write on a piece of paper that he denied the charge. But ultimately, he was sent to jail for three days. After his stint in this Florida jail, Daniel gets out and he decides he wants to go back to Orlando, Florida and go to the SeaWorld where he had previously jumped into the manatee exhibit. And so he was gonna go and presumably check out the manatees as well as some other animals. When he got to the park, he made his way over to the killer whale demonstration where some trainers were gonna be swimming around in this enclosure with these massive killer whales. And witnesses said they remember seeing Daniel in the stands watching the show being just totally transfixed and open-mouthed and fascinated with what he was looking at. But apparently Daniel's biggest reaction to any part in the show was when the trainers brought out Tilikum, the biggest killer whale ever held in captivity, measuring over 22 feet long and weighing over 12,000 pounds. Daniel was just totally taken with Tilikum. So that night, after the park shut down and everyone went home, Daniel came back, now wearing a bathing suit. He hops the fence and he sneaks back into SeaWorld the same way he did a couple years earlier when he snuck into the manatee exhibit. And somehow he managed to go through the park without being picked up on a camera. And he makes his way over to the killer whale enclosure. He hops the fence, he takes off his shirt, takes off his shoes. So he's just got his bathing suit on and he jumps into the massive pool with Tilikum. When Daniel jumped into the manatee exhibit, he had said he just wanted to play with the manatees. And so it's assumed that when he jumped in with Tilikum, he just wanted to play with Tilikum. And apparently Tilikum was really eager to play with Daniel because Tilikum quickly played with Daniel by biting his shorts and bringing him to the bottom of the pool and dragging him along the bottom until Daniel drowned. And then after he drowned, Tilikum basically thrashed him around, throwing him up and down, ripping off pieces of him until finally he draped Daniel's body over his back and that's where Tilikum kept him. The next day when the staff showed up and made this discovery, they couldn't get Daniel's body away from Tilikum because Tilikum wanted to keep his toy. And so they had to use a special medical hoist to lift Tilikum up into the air to recover Daniel's body. Daniel's death was ruled an accident as a result of his poor decision-making, and so as such, Tilikum was not punished. In 1910, miners drilling inside of the Nika cave in Chihuahua, Mexico, punctured through the ground and discovered this flooded cavern. After pumping the water out and stepping inside of this cavern, they were amazed to see these massive gypsum crystals that had formed on the walls and the ceiling all over this cave. Although the crystals were beautiful, they were far less valuable than what these miners were after, which was silver. So instead of trying to, you know, mine out these crystals, they told the locals in the area that they had found this cave and that they really ought to come down here and protect it because it's this amazing natural wonder. And so for the next hundred years, the locals in Chihuahua, Mexico, basically kept this cave that they nicknamed the Cave of Swords under lock and key so that no one would go in there and destroy these amazing crystals. Fast forward to the year 2000 and two men are inside of this mine, not the Nika mine where the Cave of Swords is located, but a mine that was right up against it. And they're drilling down and they're actually at the same level of where the Cave of Swords is located. And they don't know it yet, but they're drilling underneath the Cave of Swords. 
and they eventually puncture into the rock, revealing this underground flooded cavern. Now, these two men are not tracking that this is right underneath the Cave of Swords. So they're not thinking there could be crystals inside of this flooded cavern. They're thinking there could be silver down there. So after pumping all the water out of this cavern, they crawl down inside and it opens up into this massive cavern with these enormous crystals coming out of the ceiling, the walls, everywhere. And they are like 10 times, 15 times bigger than any of the biggest crystals inside of the Cave of Swords. These are literally the biggest crystals in the world, and this cavern looks like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. It's this unbelievable landscape. This new cave would be dubbed the Giant Crystal Cave, and like its counterpart, the Cave of Swords, it would be handed over to locals to protect. Now you'd think people would be lining up like crazy to get inside either of these two caves to see these natural wonders, but the truth is, Nobody wants to go inside of these caves because they're death traps. Even though both of these caves have had the water drained out of them, their humidity level is still 100%, which means if you're in there too long in either of these two caves, you run the risk of your lungs starting to fill with water, effectively drowning you. In fact, scientists speculate that it would take about 10 minutes for this to happen to you if you were inside one of these caves, assuming you were not wearing a special breathing device that was pumping dry air back into you. But even if you were wearing these special air tanks, the cave would still kill you in about an hour because the temperature exceeds 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you combine the extreme heat with the humidity and the tight enclosed nature of an underground cave, you have a natural oven that if you stay in there too long, it will cook you alive. So the only people that go inside of these caves are researchers that wear all the special equipment and they only go inside for a couple of minutes at most. But in 2001, so one year after the discovery of the Big Crystal Cave, one of the workers who helped drain out the Big Crystal Cave decided, you know what, I want a crystal for myself. And so using his understanding of the mine and his access to this particular section of the mine, he made his way down and got inside of the Big Crystal Cave. Now, the only special equipment he had was a saw because he figured he could get in there and saw off a piece of one of these crystals and get out of there in just a couple of minutes, certainly well before anything bad would happen to him. So he gets inside, he identifies the crystal he wants, and he starts sawing off the bottom of this crystal. But it dislodges a huge chunk of the crystal that falls on him. Now, when it fell on him, that didn't kill him, but it pinned him inside of this cave. At this point, reality must have sunk in very quickly for this guy. He didn't tell anyone where he was going because what he was doing was illegal. And he knows that nobody checks inside of these caves to see if people are trapped or stuck because they don't expect people to go into these caves and they're off limits. A couple of days later, researchers went down into Big Crystal Cave and they discovered this guy still pinned underneath the big crystal he had cut from the ceiling. It was unclear whether he had died from drowning or from being cooked alive, but either way, he was deceased. To this day, Big Crystal Cave and the Cave of Swords are strictly off limits to the public. On June 30th, 2002, an 18-year-old named Daniel Dick was on vacation with his mother and his two younger brothers in Hawaii. Daniel had just graduated from his high school in Los Angeles, where he was the student body president. He was known to invite all of his classmates over to his house all the time for dinners, and girls would call him all the time to try to get advice about their boyfriends. And Daniel also would befriend troubled teens in an attempt to kind of pick them up and get them back on the straight and narrow. When he and his family left for this vacation, he had been working part-time at a grocery store and was getting ready to attend California State University in the fall. That morning, Daniel went down to the beach where he planned on doing some swimming and maybe laying out in the sun for a little bit. And pretty quickly, he met three girls. And after about 30 minutes of chatting with them, he asked them if they wanted to climb over the fence and check out the blowhole. A blowhole is a fairly narrow hole that is situated on rocks right near where water is crashing. And this hole is usually formed by molten lava that has passed through underneath. 
And what happens is this hole is connected to a tunnel that feeds down and out into the water. So when the waves come in, they go through this tunnel and they get rocketed up this little opening, causing a massive geyser of water. Now, if you don't go near the blowhole, it's not dangerous at all. It's just a very cool natural phenomenon. The beach that Daniel and these girls were on was situated right near an infamously dangerous blowhole called the Halona blowhole. The reason it was so dangerous is because the water it connected to through that tunnel was some of the most violent in all of Hawaii. So when those waves came barreling through the tunnel, it would shoot 30 plus feet in the air. And so to make sure everybody understood you're only allowed to watch the blowhole from a distance, they actually put up a fence all the way around it and put up signs saying, do not go any closer. To give you a sense of how powerful the water was that was churning through this tunnel, if you were standing on the other side of the fence watching the blowhole from a safe distance, you could feel the ground shaking as the waves would rumble through the tunnel and then explode out of the blowhole. According to Daniel's family and friends, he was not a reckless person, he was just a very adventurous person. And so something like this blowhole really piqued his interest and he just couldn't handle being on the outside of the fence. He really wanted to get right up there and get a look at it. In fact, he told these girls he wanted to feel the power of the water hit him in the chest. That was his plan. The girls told him this was a bad idea, but he was insistent and he began walking over to the rocks where he could climb up and jump this fence. The girls went with him, but they stopped short of the fence. As Daniel made his way over to the rocks, he passed by a couple that was laying on the beach. He waved to them, he climbed up the rocks, he climbed over the fence, and he made his way over to the blowhole. And he timed it to where a wave had just come in and shot a geyser up. And then as soon as the water went down and there was a break, he walked over the edge of this hole that was not very far across and he kind of arched himself over it so his chest was hovering right over where the water was gonna come up. And initially a wave came through and the water shot up and it hit him in the chest and it kind of staggered him back for a minute. And at this point, the three girls and the couple that he had passed are now yelling for him to get away from the blowhole that it's way too dangerous but it was too late. He leaned back over the blowhole right as a massive wave came barreling through the tunnel. It rocketed up and it lifted him off the ground about five feet in the air and it turned him upside down so his head is pointed down. And when he fell, he went directly into the blowhole. The couple and the three girls that saw this happen described his body position as being the perfect dive. And in order to actually get into the blowhole, you would need the perfect body position because the opening is very narrow and it goes down eight feet of just this narrow, narrow tube. And at the bottom of that, it opens up like the inside of a teapot. Then inside of there is this just vicious churning water that connects to this underground tunnel that feeds out to the sea. And so when Daniel went head first down, his momentum along with his perfect body position forced himself down through that hole into that section that's kind of like the inside of a teapot. And once you're inside, there's no way to go back up again. The opening is too tight and there's nothing to hold on to. You wouldn't have the ability to force yourself up through that hole again. So the only way out is through the underground tunnel that leads out to the sea. But there are constantly waves pounding their way up this tunnel into the section where Daniel had fallen into. And so realistically, anybody that tries to swim through this fairly long underground tunnel is only gonna get so far before a wave forces them back or traps them in some way in this underground tunnel. As soon as Daniel went into the blowhole, the couple and the three girls immediately climbed up the rocks, hopped over the fence and began looking into the tunnel, yelling for Daniel. And as they're sitting there yelling for him and yelling for people on the beach to call 911, they would feel the ground start to shake as another wave would come through the tunnel and erupt through the blowhole. And they know every time that happened, Daniel, if he was alive, he was completely submerged in water for 30 seconds or so every iteration that this blowhole erupted. By the time the police showed up, Daniel has been trapped inside of this blowhole for some time and no one's heard him, no one's seen him, and so it's starting to look pretty grim. And the police would say it's nearly impossible for anybody to survive being inside of this blowhole, especially at high tide, which is when he went in. In fact, the police would say, we can't even send divers in there until low tide, because if we send someone in now, they're gonna get killed inside of this blowhole. It's too violent inside of there. And so the best they could do was put a weighted line into the blowhole anchored on the outside, so that if by some miracle, Daniel was still alive, he'd be able to grab this line and pull himself up. He probably would not be able to pull himself through the hole to safety. 
but at least he could keep himself out of the water until rescuers could get there the next day at low tide. But when low tide came the next day and divers went out to the water, they discovered Daniel's body. It was floating near the area where water actually gets sucked into the tunnel and out through the blowhole. During low tide, he must have been pulled back out through the tunnel out to sea. It's unclear how long Daniel was alive once he landed inside of the blowhole or whether he ever attempted to actually swim through that tunnel out to sea, but at some point he did drown. Daniel's mother petitioned to have a metal grate put over the blowhole so that nobody else would fall in and meet the same fate as her son. But this proposal was met with criticism from the locals who said the problem was not the blowhole, the problem was people not respecting the power of nature. And so while a fence still surrounds Holona blowhole telling people to stay back, the entrance to the blowhole is still uncovered. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and open their cereal. But when you open the bag, make sure you tear down the side of the bag, not along the intended seams at the top. In 1989, 22-year-old Eloise Lindsay was a fresh college graduate and she was at a crossroads in her life because even though she just earned her degree, she really didn't know what she wanted to do with her life. And because she was an experienced backpacker, she thought a good way to, you know, kind of get her life together would be to go on a sort of retreat, go out into the woods, go out into nature and kind of find herself. So she had planned this very detailed 43.3 mile hike along the Appalachian Trail, starting in South Carolina, where the first seven days of the hike, she would be totally on her own. And then at the seven day mark, she would meet up with a friend at a particular rendezvous point. Her friend would give her resupplies and would be her companion for the rest of the hike. When Eloise told her parents what her plans were, they were not concerned for her safety because she was an experienced backpacker. She had made trips like this before. And so they said, great, we'll see you when you get back. So on November 4th, Eloise sets out to begin her journey down the Appalachian Trail. And the first couple of days of her hike were great. The weather was beautiful, the scenery was amazing, and she had all this time to just kind of be by herself and look internal and think hard about what she wanted to do with her life. But on the third day, when she woke up, she was sleeping inside of a tent she had camped just off the trail. She woke up and she had this intense sense of dread. She couldn't really place where it was coming from, but she knew something was wrong. And she's kind of doing inventory of her life. Like, what did I forget? Is there, is there something that I'm just not thinking about right now? But she kind of pushes it aside mentally and thinks, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna pack up my campsite here and get hiking and I'm bound to, you know, come up with what it is that's making me feel this way. So she gets out of her tent and she begins packing up her campsite and she's looking out, kind of scanning the tree line, not because she was looking for anything, but just because she happened to be looking out. And she could have sworn that she saw a man standing, you know, 30, 40 feet away behind a tree. And she kind of did a double take and was staring at him. It's, you know, it's broad daylight, it's the morning and they're near a trail. So it isn't like unbelievable that there might be someone near her at that very moment. But she kind of did a double take and she looked at them again and this person was gone. And she stood there for a minute, just kind of looking in the direction of where she had seen this guy, wondering, you know, is my mind playing tricks on me? Did I really see someone there? You know, why aren't they showing themselves again? If, if there was someone there, they clearly must have just been looking at me. Why aren't they, you know, poking their heads out again to communicate with me in some way? We're out in the middle of nowhere. We should be talking to each other. But the guy never shows himself again. And so as she's standing there wondering what she should do, she isn't ready to yell out to this person because there's part of her that's a little bit nervous about yelling out to some stranger in the middle of the woods. But she starts to get this really intense feeling that she's being watched and it feels an awful lot like the sense of dread she had while she was in the tent. And she's starting to wonder, you know, are my instincts or is my sixth sense picking up that I'm being watched? Like there's some predator out there looking at me right now. And even though she has no way of knowing if that's actually true, she's alone in the middle of the woods. And even though she's experienced, she can't help but feel really vulnerable. And because this guy is just not showing himself again, she feels a little bit threatened. And so she begins to panic and she starts packing up all of her stuff as quickly as she can. And as soon as she can, she takes off down the trail away from that guy she saw in the woods. As she was walking down this trail, she couldn't help but think someone was 
right behind her. And she kept turning around to see if this person or whoever it was was behind her and no one was ever there. But this visceral feeling that she was being watched, that, that sense of dread she had, it just was not going away. And so she started walking faster and faster. Before long, she was running. And she's realizing that she's in a section of the Appalachian Trail that's very remote. She's not near civilization. She's not near her next rendezvous point. And so she's thinking to herself, I need to get off this trail, I need to get to a road, I need to get away from here as soon as I possibly can. And so her options were to continue on this trail for several miles, and it would probably take her until well into the night before she was going to reach civilization, or she could take a shortcut because she believed there was a road that was running parallel to her trail, but it was way down the mountain. It would require leaving the trail and basically cutting through the wilderness to get down to this road. But she was pretty confident it was right down there. And because this threat of this person or thing following her was so intense for her, she decided to leave the trail. She couldn't stand the idea of having to spend another night out in the middle of the woods with this person stalking her. And so she walks off the trail and starts running down the mountain. It wasn't long before she started to hear audible sounds coming from what she believed to be this person that was following her. And she would turn around and there'd be no one there. And then she started to walk, you know, trying to listen as she's walking and she would hear footsteps far away from her and she'd turn and there'd be nobody there, but she was certain someone was following her, someone was stalking her. And the sounds that were coming out of this person, this animal, whatever it was, they sounded like, you know, a deep male voice, but she couldn't recognize if it was a language of some kind. It just sounded more like a grunt or, or a yell of some kind. And so her heart rate's elevated, she's panicking, and she's walking as fast as she can, just through the middle of the wilderness, hoping she's walking towards this road. But after walking and running for miles into the middle of nowhere, she has not come to a road. It's now completely dark out, and she knows she's lost. And so she has to set up camp in the middle of nowhere, and she knows somewhere out in the middle of the woods is some person or something that is stalking me. And she's all alone. She has no way to contact anyone. She doesn't have a cell phone. It's 1989. And so she sets up her campsite and she gets in her tent. She zips it up and she lays there hoping she doesn't hear any sounds. And sure enough, within minutes of being inside of that tent, she starts hearing those audible sounds coming from somewhere in the forest. And she hears what sounds like heavy footsteps walking around the perimeter of her campsite all night long she hears this but luckily they don't come up right to her tent so there's some separation between her and whatever is making these sounds and then finally you know the sun comes up she is out of that tent packs it up and continues running in the direction she hopes is the road and of course all day long she has that sense that someone is watching her she's hearing footsteps coming from behind her she would turn she doesn't see anything she would hear that audible grunting sound that that low voice coming from somewhere behind her but again she would never see whoever it was or whatever it was that was making the sound and then again the sun is starting to set and she has not found the road she hasn't found a trail and she's thinking to herself i can't even backtrack because if i turn around and start walking backwards i'm bound to run into this very thing i'm trying to escape and so once again she sets up her campsite in the middle of nowhere she gets inside and as soon as she's laying in her tent she starts hearing those heavy footsteps somewhere out in the woods kind of walking around the perimeter of her campsite she's hearing that that low audible sound that she can't quite place and at some point she falls asleep, she gets up the next morning, she jumps out of her tent, packs it up and starts running, hopefully in the direction that will bring her to civilization. A couple days later when Eloise was supposed to meet her friend on the trail at the seven day mark and they were gonna finish the hike together, well, Eloise doesn't show up. But after several hours when Eloise did not show up, her friend left the trail and contacted authorities and filed a missing person report. And the police would launch this massive search for Eloise along the stretch of the Appalachian Trail where she had said she would be. And for the next 14 days, hundreds of police and volunteers and helicopters are scouring this area and there's no sign of Eloise. And so after 14 days from the time her friend filed the missing person report, the police had to turn the search off and they say, look, we can't find her. Two days after the search was terminated, so 23 days after Eloise had initially set off for her trek through the Appalachian Trail, a hunter that was out in the middle of nowhere near the Appalachian Trail discovers Eloise perched up against a tree. She's totally emaciated. She's dehydrated. She's delirious, but she's alive. At first, she was terrified of the hunter because she believed the hunter was this person that had been following her. 
But when she realized he was there to help, she went with him, she was brought back and brought to a hospital and she was checked out. And besides being dehydrated and, you know, emaciated, she was okay. And she would detail in multiple interviews and in her official statement that she had been chased for the past almost three weeks in the middle of the woods. And she doesn't know who it was or why they were chasing her. And then interestingly, she said right before she was found, so a couple of days before this hunter finds her, this person, this thing, whatever it was that was following her, got so close to her a couple different times that she was so scared she ditched her backpack that contained all of her life-saving equipment, like her sleeping bag and her tent, and it had some food and water in there. She ditched that so she could be lighter, so she could run faster away from this thing that is chasing her in the woods. So you gotta figure, you gotta be at such a high level of fear that you're prepared to ditch the one thing you really require to survive out in the wilderness, which was her pack full of supplies. And then after she's ditched her pack and she's run for some distance, she's got no supplies, no food, no water, she stumbles across this tree in the middle of nowhere that wedged inside the trunk is a cache of donuts and pound cake. And so she takes the donuts and pound cake and between that and the stream water she had found, that's what kept her alive for the last few days before she was found. Eloise says she has no idea what to make of her experience and law enforcement were baffled by it as well. Some people think Eloise had a mental break and she effectively made this whole situation up, that she really was lost in the woods, but no one was chasing her and she was just kind of paranoid and running around the wilderness for a couple of weeks. Other people, including park rangers that worked that stretch of the Appalachian Trail, believe it's possible she could have been stalked by wild men, which are basically people that live out in the mountains that are effectively feral, that live off the land, and they've been known, according to local legend, they've been known to attack park rangers, and people that live out in that area have claimed to have seen these wild men, and they kind of match the description of what she was describing. But as of right now, there's no official explanation for what happened to her other than she got lost and was found again. On June 7, 1951, two families from Santa Fe, New Mexico met up at the Santa Fe Ski Basin to have a picnic together and to enjoy the mountain air. During the summer months when there's no snow on the ground, the Santa Fe Ski Basin is a very popular location for hikers because the terrain is very rugged and if you get up to the top of the basin, there's these incredible views overlooking the valley. But on this day, the two families decided they wanted to have a picnic at the base of the basin, basically looking up the mountain. As the parents were setting up the picnic site, the kids started playing together and that was Larry and Janet McGee who were brother and sister aged seven and five respectively and Stephen Cross who was three years old. After they finished setting up their picnic site they look around and realize the kids are gone and they're thinking we just saw them like two minutes ago so they can't have gone very far and so they start looking around for their kids and they can't find them they're yelling out for them and they're starting to get a little bit more worried and they start branching out farther and farther and they realize the only other place they could have gone is up into the woods which are very steep and very rugged. So they're thinking, well, they can't have gone into the mountains. That would be impossible for these young kids to get very far. And they aren't responding to our calls. It's possible they could have been abducted. And so one of the parents ran down to the main building of the actual ski resort where they kept a staff member in there during the summer months. And they were able to get inside and use a phone and they called authorities. So the police come out and they set up these huge spotlights that are aimed up at the mountain. And so the idea was if the kids did get up into the mountain somehow, they would see these lights and hopefully walk down to them. After they set up the spotlights, the police began combing the side of the mountain in hopes that the kids were not abducted. But despite the spotlights and hundreds of searchers and people yelling out for these kids, they never heard back from the kids. They didn't find them. And so all night they're looking for them and they're realizing that there's a pretty good chance they're probably not here. And that means they probably were abducted. And so by the following afternoon, things were really starting to look grim. There was no sign of these kids anywhere. And that's when a searcher who was way outside of the primary search area, they were about three and a half miles away, thousands of feet up in elevation. They're up there and they're looking around and they're getting ready to leave when they see something out of the corner of their eye that looks like a person. They turn around and one of the kids is poking their head up from behind a log. And the searchers run over to them and sure enough, the three kids were actually inside of this downed log and they were all okay. As the searchers are picking them up and calling this in, they're thinking to themselves, how in the world did these kids get so far away? Once the children were brought back down to the search headquarters and were reunited with their parents and were checked out by a doctor who said, yep, they're a little dehydrated, but they're okay. After all that was done, the police asked them the question that everybody was thinking, how did you get where you were found? 
and Larry, the oldest of the group, he was seven years old. It took him a minute, but eventually he said, you know, they were playing around the picnic area and they went just barely into the tree line when all of a sudden a bear came out from behind a tree and began chasing them. And the three of them ran three and a half miles up a mountain to find this log, which they jumped inside of, and they hid inside of this log from this bear, which apparently was patrolling the area looking for them. And in addition to this bear that was apparently walking around the area looking for them, Larry said they were especially scared of the gorilla that was walking around the area looking for them as well. Now it's easy to discount Larry and the kid's story because you could say, okay, well, the gorilla they saw was actually just a searcher looking for them except there was no one in that area looking for the kids near that log until right before they were found. It was kind of like a last ditch effort to push outside the boundaries of the main search area. It was just kind of a miracle they actually located them. And Larry and the kids were saying this gorilla and this bear were looking for them on the first day and first night they were out there. So there were no searchers out there at that time. As for the bear, there have been bear sightings in the Santa Fe Ski Basin, although it is fairly rare. But if it was a bear that was chasing these kids, it would have caught them. A bear is not gonna not be able to catch three small children running uphill. So either there wasn't a bear, or it was some other animal that might have resembled a bear. But what type of an animal would chase three small children who are very vulnerable three and a half miles up a mountain only to abandon them? But even if we say, you know what, there's no way the bear and the gorilla had anything to do with this. This is just kids who got lost and they wound up in the woods and they were found and that's it. Fine, but I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old and I can tell you right now, there's no way they could cover a three and a half mile distance uphill in really rugged mountainous terrain in a 24 hour cycle. There's just, there's no way without help that's not possible. I would say the only caveat to that would be if my children were fearful for their lives, in which case adrenaline would kick in and they probably could cover that distance in a 24 hour period. That certainly lends credibility to the idea that Larry, Janet and Steve were in fact running for their lives and they had that adrenaline kick and that's how they were able to cover that distance. But were they really running from a bear or a gorilla? We don't know. And there's been no further investigation into this case. And I think that's because the kids were found alive. The parents, the police, they're happy and everybody moved on. From 2002 to 2006, Colin Finnerty was perhaps the most successful college quarterback in history, winning three national championships and being named the Division II player of the decade. He was also perhaps the toughest college quarterback in history. Most quarterbacks will spend their careers looking to avoid getting smashed by defenders, not Cullen. Cullen was six foot two, 240 pounds, and he would tell his teammates that he wanted to get hit and he would hit back. And his coaches hated it about him, but his teammates loved this about him. Cullen was also famous for playing through injuries. His junior year in college, he broke his collarbone and he didn't tell anyone and he played through an entire playoff series that he won. After college, Cullen's professional football career was not nearly as successful as his amateur one. He played briefly for two NFL football teams, the Baltimore Ravens and the Denver Broncos, but when he wasn't getting any playing time and he just could see the writing on the wall that this was not gonna be a match, he was not gonna make it in the NFL, he left for Europe to play in a European football league. But when his European football career started to sputter out as well around 2009, he came back to the United States where he joined a very small time indoor arena football league. And while Cullen's love of football was still there as much as it ever was, he knew at this point playing at this low of a level that his career was effectively over. Around the same time that Cullen was hanging up his football cleats, he would meet Jennifer, who would become his wife. She was an all-state volleyball player and in many ways was just as competitive and as athletic as Cullen was. They were kind of like a perfect match for each other. They married in 2010 and Cullen, this big man, big time quarterback, was shaking and crying at the altar because he was so nervous and excited about marrying Jennifer. Because I think this was a really big turning point for him where he was basically putting football in the past 
and starting this new life and building a family with Jennifer and he was really excited about it. The newlywed couple moved into a house together in Michigan where they had two kids and Cullen landed a good job in medical sales and by all accounts, Cullen was just hitting his stride post football. On Memorial Day weekend in 2013, Jennifer's family was planning this three-day fishing trip along the Baldwin River in Michigan and the Finnerty's decided they would join them. And so Cullen and his wife and kids, they rented a cabin that was gonna be near the campsite that Jennifer's family was staying at. And for the entire weekend, it was just this great fishing trip where everybody had a great time and the weather was beautiful. And on May 26th, so the last night of this three-day fishing trip, Cullen, who had recently purchased this pontoon boat that they had used for this fishing trip, he wanted to just go out one more time on his boat, this boat that he was really proud of, and fish for another 30, 45 minutes before ending the weekend. So Cullen put on his waders and his jacket, he grabbed his fishing pole, and he had his family drive him to the stairs that led down to the water where his pontoon boat was. Before he walked down the steps, he turned and told his family that he'd be out for about 30 to 45 minutes, and that he wanted to be picked up at the next boat ramp down the way, and that he would call when he needed a ride. 42 minutes later at 9.27 p.m., Jennifer receives a phone call from her husband, and she's expecting it to be the call where he says, okay, I'm ready to get picked up. But when she answers the phone, Cullen is frantic. And he's telling her that he's being followed by two men in the tree line, that he's out on the water on his pontoon, but there are two men in the tree line that he can't see, but he can hear them. And they've been following him for some time. And before Jennifer can even get a word out, Cullen says to her that he's gonna beach the boat and take his clothes off and then he hangs up. Jennifer immediately tries calling Cullen back repeatedly, but he's not picking up, and so she's left feeling totally confused about what her husband has just told her. But what stood out to her was how scared he sounded on the phone, and fear was not something she typically associated with Cullen. This beast of a man, this tough football player, he didn't get scared. So for him to be that scared sounding and to be describing people basically stalking him, she knew he was in serious trouble. So she calls 911 and she describes where he is in the Baldwin River and the police take her report and say, we'll send someone out right away. After Jennifer got off the phone with police, she called her family and told them about this really strange phone call from Cullen and how she had just called the police and she didn't know what to do. And so her brother tried calling Cullen and Cullen answered. And when he did, Matt said, hey, Cullen, where are you? And Cullen would say, I don't know where I am, but there's these two guys that are still following me. And Matt would say, you know, are you still on your boat? Are you on land? And all Cullen said is, you know, it's getting pretty rough out here. And then he hung up. Afterwards, Matt would call Jen and he would tell her about this phone call with Cullen and it really didn't add any clarity to the situation. And so Jen and her family decide the best thing they can do is go to the boat ramp where Cullen had said he wanted to be picked up in hopes that maybe he would make his way there and they would find him. So Jennifer and her family head out to this location and Cullen's not there. They get out, they're yelling for him. There's no sign of him. And shortly after, a police car would show up because this was one of the areas where Jennifer had said when she spoke to police that Cullen might be. And so the police officer gets out, they take an official statement from Jennifer, and at this point they file an official missing person report. Before the police began looking for Cullen, they reached out to his wireless service provider and they asked them to ping his cell phone from the tower. Any service provider has the ability to roughly triangulate the location of a cell phone based on the last few locations of the phone. The last four locations that the service provider pinged for Cullen were up to four miles apart from each other, which was bizarre in its own way because the idea that in a very rugged, rough area in a very short amount of time that Cullen had been moving four, five, six, seven miles just to get to these different points, that didn't really make sense. But also when they looked at these points on a map, it looked like each of them was either near a paved road or in order to get to them, you would have had to cross a paved road. And so they're thinking to themselves, why does he keep moving point to point if at any one of these locations, he's near relative safety. But as strange as these four locations were, the police now had a really solid starting point. So they dispatched people to each of these points and they began combing along the river where he had last been seen. And within an hour, they discovered his boat. It was a little ways down from where he had been dropped off. It was missing an oar and it was basically beached on the side of the river. It wasn't clear if it had been intentionally beached but Cullen wasn't in it. And when they searched around the area, they couldn't find any sign that Cullen was in the area. They were yelling for him. He wasn't yelling back. Interestingly, a man who owned property near where the pontoon boat was found reported to police hearing screaming or yelling coming from the area where the boat was found around the same time that Cullen went missing. 
But despite this piece of information, it didn't actually help them discover where Cullen actually went. For the next 48 hours, police and hundreds of people searched in the areas where his cell phone had pinged and along the river where his pontoon had been found, but there was no sign of him. Then on the evening of May 28th, approximately 48 hours after Cullen had gone missing, they discovered his body. It was located less than a half mile away from a paved road, and it was situated in between those four points that the cell phone provider had given. He was laying completely face down with his right arm under his body and his left arm over his head clutching some grass. When they rolled him over, he had some blood coming out of his nose, but besides that, there was no significant trauma anywhere on his body. Cullen appeared to be wearing all of his clothes. However, it was noted that the strap on his waders was really badly twisted. Now, if he had never taken his clothes off, that would have been something he would have fixed. It would have been very uncomfortable when he started this trip to go fishing. That would have been something he would have fixed. Now, he said to his wife on the phone that he was going to be taking his clothes off, which there was no explanation for that, but he clearly said that to his wife and she reported that to police. And so some have speculated that between that phone call and finding him with the twisted strap on his waders, that that indicates that perhaps his clothes did come off at some point over the past couple of days and were put back on again, either by him or by someone else. His cell phone had also been found in his front pocket, indicating that those cell phone pings had been his actual location. Initially, Cullen's autopsy was completely inconclusive. There was no trauma to his body. There was no obvious thing that killed him. But later on, it was determined he died of pneumonia caused by inhaling his own vomit. So we don't know how you get to a place where you're inhaling your own vomit, but I would imagine you're in a pretty panicked state of mind if that could happen to you. Many people believe Cullen's death was the result of a traumatic brain injury caused by all the years of playing football and getting hit in the head. And so that can lead to paranoia. And so perhaps this was a fit of paranoia. He got turned around, he got scared, he thought somebody was chasing him. And then, you know, he vomits and inhales his vomit and that ultimately kills him. And in 2011, Cullen had briefly shown signs of being a little bit paranoid when one day he thought someone was following him and he actually went to a family member's house and said, I think someone's following me, but he could never identify where this person was or who they were. But even if this was a fit of paranoia and no one was following him in the woods, well, why didn't he stop on the paved road every time he crossed it? Because that would have represented safety. I mean, in 2011, when he supposedly had another fit of paranoia, his instincts were to go to a family member and to seek help. And so you would think his instincts in this situation would be similar. He would seek help, he would seek safety, but he continuously left safety. He left the road, he left his boat. His boat was safety, why did he leave his boat? And even if we turn this around and we say, no, it was not a fit of paranoia, that he was in fact being followed by someone or something in the woods, well then why would that prompt him to call his wife and say, I'm gonna get out of the boat and take my clothes off and then proceed to walk four, five, six, seven miles in a very short period of time, crossing over a paved road at least one or two times and not stopping, not signaling for help? That doesn't make sense either. And what was that screaming that that resident heard coming from the area where the pontoon boat was found? Unfortunately, there are many questions in this case and the vast majority of them will go unanswered. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please give the like button a gift card to their favorite restaurant, but don't put any money on it. 